as far as the end of the semester goes. So do pay attention um, to the posts there. Um, I, I, I guess that's all to say about that. I was trying to think like there was more, but I, I, I think that's it. Uh, we're going to continue today looking at JavaScript. And again, I, I want to re repeat sort of the overview of JavaScript just to make sure that that's really firmly understood by everyone. Again, the idea of JavaScript is JavaScript adds interactivity to the page. And what's critical about it is that it adds interactivity to the page without having to go back to the web server and to get a new page. So, I mean, you could say links are interactivity, right? Because you click on it and another page comes up. Well, yeah, that's interactivity, but that requires downloading a complete brand new page from the web server. Whereas JavaScript allows you to make changes to an existing page uh, without having to request a complete brand new page from the server. And what we drew for the diagram looked like this, whereas we had the client which again is someone running a browser on some device connected through the internet to a web server and the web server either delivers HTML pages or processes server-side scripts which generate web pages on the fly. That would be something like a Google search. There isn't a completed web page sitting out there for every Google search that you might possibly do. There are instructions on how to do a Google search that runs on Google server and accesses their database and creates a web page on the fly. In either case, what gets delivered to the client is a mix of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that JavaScript is able to point to the different things on the page and change them, change the properties. So we saw an example last time of doing a, uh, a thumbnail page where we clicked on the thumbnail and we changed um, an image that appeared. Um, the recipe for JavaScript is that one, there's typically going to be a user event. Again, this isn't 100% of the time, but most of the time there's going to be some user event that causes the JavaScript to start to execute. And that's any way the user can interact with the page. So clicking on something, putting their mouse over something, pressing a key. All those things are ways that a user can interact with a page. Any of you that are on Twitter, for example, in Twitter, um, as you type, it shows you how many characters you have left because you only have 140 characters in Twitter. So as you type in, it shows that number of characters decreasing by one for every character that you type in. That's an example of a client-side script because that runs on the client and every time you press a key, it looks to see how many things you've typed in and updates the number of how many um, characters you have left. In fact, I think it even does more than that, and if you exceed the 140 characters, it actually changes it to display it in red. So that is, again, an example of JavaScript, where a user action gets the ball rolling. We then have, we then make use of something that is called the DOM, which stands for Document Object Model. And that is a way for JavaScript to refer to different things on the page. So when we do a mouse over effect where we want to change an image from one image to another, well, we might have a page with a dozen images on it. How do we know which image that we want to change? We have to point to the specific image. And the language used to do that is called the DOM. Last but not least, we have the JavaScript language itself, which we will just, again, we will just get a taste of these two things because 
they're a whole topic unto himself. He could spend a whole semester talking just about that. User events are pretty easy. They're the things that the user can do to interact with the page. Um, some of them more advanced than others. Um, for example, I'm going to download this example, although um, it is a little bit advanced. Um, this actually takes advantage of a library of JavaScript animations because you can do animations with JavaScript as well. So I'm going to download this example that I use in my multimedia class and we'll take a look at it real quick. And then we'll look at some of the um, um, we'll look at some of uh, the simpler um, JavaScript examples. And again, I go over JavaScript just to introduce sort of the concept to you and give you a sense of what the capabilities are. This still has a couple glitches in it, I have to say, but it's mostly correct. Okay, I need the audience to announce. It's time for Wheel of Fortune. And we have a wheel. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to open this up in Chrome because I'm a little suspicious about how it's going to work in Internet Explorer. We have a wheel. And you can spin the wheel simply by putting your mouse and holding the mouse down and dragging it. And it actually makes a little clicking sound and then it stops on a particular value. We'll take a minute to look at this, although again, this is a little advanced for this class. This is done on a Mac, so it kind of looks goofy. Let me open it up in WordPad. Now let me open it up in Notepad. All right, there we go. And we can see what I guess the main thing I want to point out is how we have an on mouse down and on mouse up. So when you click the mouse, that sort of is getting ready to start to spin. When you release the mouse, when you let it go, is when it actually does the spin. And really what this script does is this script does a calculation based on, and again this is where it's buggy, based on the position of the mouse to determine how hard to spin it. All right, so if I just, if the mouse is like positioned over here, it just spins it slowly. 
if it goes like that, it spins it faster. All right. I then have a function that does the spinning that takes advantage of these libraries to do animation called the green sock libraries. The one thing that we didn't get into in this class, because again, you know, it's a whole topic into itself, is how you can use CSS and JavaScript actually to accomplish animation. All right, we do talk about that um, in the multimedia class, CISS 215. All right, so at any rate, let's look at a couple of more examples. I am going to get this ready to upload. Um, let's look at a couple more examples. One of them is very similar to the example that I did last week. Not last week, last class. And one of them is different. Um, it's uh, the mouse over menu example. So let's look. Here's the example similar to what we had last time, where I have thumbnails. Actually, again, I don't have the HTML shiv, so I will open this up in Chrome. So I put my mouse over the image, a bigger version of the image appears. And yes, those are my two bunnies. That's, that is a giant rabbit, yes. It, it's called a Flemish giant, and it's really big, and it's really nice and friendly. This little one's a little bit shyer. Anyhow, if we look at the code for this, we'll see that we have on mouse over, and on mouse out. Actually, we don't have on mouse out. I lied. We have on mouse over so that when the user puts their mouse on the thumbnail, it changes the big picture to be either the big picture of the Flemish giant or the big picture of the dwarf rabbit. How do we do that? Again, this is very similar to what we did last time, except I think we used an on-click uh, method on the button, which accomplishes the same thing, but requires a different user action to trigger it. All right? On mouse over, so when the user puts our mouse on the thumbnail, we first point to the picture that we want to change. What do we want to point to? We want to point to the thing on the page that has an ID of big. So document get element by ID big. What about that do we want to change? We want to change the source of it. In other words, the file that we're going to display. And if we put our mouse over the Flemish giant thumbnail, we get the, fle the larger picture of the Flemish giant. If we put our mouse over the uh, thumbnail for the dwarf rabbit, we get the dwarf uh, rabbit. Um, big image. So this is pretty much the same as last time, um, but again, we're using a different method to start it. It's your job to sort of figure as a designer, like, what's the best way to make it work? Yes? Yes, in fact, we'll go over that, um, we'll go over a better example of that in a minute. Yes? Yes. Are there any other questions? Let's go and do that. All right. 
I'm going to go and put a paragraph here. And I'm going to give a paragraph an ID. Why do I give it an ID? I give it an ID because <coughs> I want to be able to point to it. Now, this is a small web page, and it really only has a couple paragraphs. But again, keep in mind on a bigger web page, you might have all sorts of paragraphs here. You have to specify which one you want to change. So in my HTML code, I'm going to make the page look a certain way when it loads. In other words, I'm going to show the picture of the Flemish giant, and I'm going to have the title say Flemish giant. In fact, let's do this, actually. Let's change that to be an H1. And let's put that above the image. Now, what I want to do is on mouse over, I want to do two things. I want to change the source of the picture to be the Flemish giant JPEG, and I also want to change the title. So how do I change the title? I do just about the same thing. And I'm going to say document get element by ID pick title. What am I going to change about it? I'm going to change the inner HTML. What is the inner HTML? The inner HTML is the HTML that's between the start and end tag. So I'm literally pointing to this H1 and I'm going to change the text. I'm going to change the text that's between the start and end tag. And in this case, I'm going to change it to the words Flemish giant. And in this, and in the other case, I'm going to change it to say dwarf rabbit. So now, when I display this, it starts out saying Flemish Giant. As I put my mouse over there, it go and changes, goes and changes the title. Now the one thing about JavaScript is, as you can notice here, I can put on mouse over um, and I can string the instructions together with semicolons. But at some point that's going to get hard to read. All right. So in this case we did two things. We could actually do a third thing, or I could write a paragraph in, about the Flemish giant and say this, that, and the other. All right. So the more things that you do when you have a user event, it's going to be harder to read if you string everything together. That's where you get into what are called functions. Functions are a way to create a, a, a group of statements and give them a name. Then you don't have to list every statement, you just say do this function. So let's go and do that. Now, functions can be contained in a script tag. A script tag is sort of like a style tag, right? A style tag tells a browser, hey, you're not dealing with HTML anymore. You're dealing with CSS. In this case, with the script tag, it tells the browser you're not dealing with HTML anymore. You're dealing with JavaScript. So I can give a function name, and I'll call this display Flemish giant. Now, if you've done C-sharp coding or anything like that, you'll see that the functions look very similar to in that language. So I'm going to go and I'm going to copy these instructions. And I can put them on their own line. It makes for much more readable code. Then on mouse over, I can simply say 
display Flemish giant. And it will go and it will do a list of all the statements that are in that function. So I could have 10 statements in that function. I could change 10 different things. All right. Now, let's do the same thing with this Now, it's going to work the same way, but as you see, the code is a lot more readable because I don't have a string of statements. I simply say, do this block of statements. So whenever you define a function, you're displaying a block of statements. You create the function by creating a script tag. You then have the word function, the name of the function, parentheses, now, we won't get into this class what you use parentheses for. Those are called arguments where you can give values to the function. Um, and then you have use these curly brackets or braces to enclose all the statements that form the function. And again, the same rules as we talked about before apply as far as it's case sensitive, so you have to match the case and so on and so forth. We also are not going to talk about return values, which if you've studied C Sharp or other program, programming languages, you know that functions have. Yes? Uh, what's the difference between that dot? Oh, and Yeah, what, what this is, is again, we're actually changing the properties of the particular thing. And for an image, the image that displays is contained in the source attribute, right? That's how you make an image, that's how you make a specific image display, is by saying, I want to change the source attribute. So if I wanted this to be a different image, if I had a different thumbnail, I'd change the name of the image there. When you write JavaScript, you're doing sort of the same thing that you'd be doing manually if you were changing it, except you use the DOM to refer to the element, and you have to say what property. Now, we could change any number of different properties of the image. We wouldn't have to change the source property. We could, for example, change the background color of something. We could change the height of something. We could change the width of something. Every HTML attribute has a whole bunch of properties associated with it, both HTML properties and CSS properties. With JavaScript, we have to say specifically what about that element we want to change. And in the case of an image, we want to change the SRTC attribute, which is the actual image that displays. Now, in the case of inner HTML, Inner HTML refers to the stuff that's between the starting and ending tag. So in this case, between the starting and ending tag, I'm putting the words either Flemish giant or the words uh, dwarf rabbit. It's, again, it's a specific property that you want to change of an HTML element. Now, we could, for example, I could change the background color of the title. Oops. 
Let's make it pink for the Flemish giant, and let's make it yellow for the dwarf rabbit. Again, the recipe is the same. We use the DOM to point to the thing that we want to change. All right. What do we want to change? I want to change the title. What's the idea of the title? The idea of the title is pick title. So I use document dot um, get element by ID pick title. Now what is it that I want to change about it? I want to change something about the style. All right. What about the style? I want to change the style so that the background color is some different value. In this case, pink. In this case, yellow. Anything that you can set in your code, in your HTML or CSS code, you can change via JavaScript. So, I mean, I can set the background color, I can set the fonts, I can set all sorts of things using CSS and HTML. I can change those very same things via my JavaScript code. Now the only, and, and, you, and it's the same name for the property. The only difference is, is remember, in CSS, the property is actually background dash color. So in CSS, or anytime you have a dash in a property, in JavaScript it turns into this. Background, no dash, but then a capital letter. So we could put a different border around it if we wanted to. So again, the border is something that we could set via our CSS, and anything that we can set via our CSS or our HTML, we can change. So I'm going to change this to put a different kind of border depending on what mouse, what image we mouse over. All right. Now, is that effective? Does that communicate anything? Not really. This, in a way, is sort of like, um, you know, um, the advice someone gave Spider-Man once, right? With great power comes great responsibility, right? It's almost like CSS. With CSS, remember, we can set colors for everything. We can literally make everything on the page have its own color. Is it a good idea to do that? Probably not. All right, so you have to be careful how you do it and do it in a way that's going to communicate. But from a technical perspective, anything we can set on the page, we can change via JavaScript. Yes? Uh, in CSS, if we were able to, uh, in the last class, you added that pound sign, and 
then the name of the ID. Yes. If you did that in CSS, so pick a title. Right. And did all the CSS in yes. the background. Yes. You wouldn't have to do all the JavaScript for that, right? Well, in other words, what you're saying is this. If I went in and created style, and defined for pick title a background color of pink I can't type border Yes, I could define it that way in my style. What does JavaScript provide, though? What does JavaScript bring to the equation? It brings to the equation the ability to change it on the fly without reloading the page. So, for example, I could initially make the pick title have this look. So, if we look at this, that's how it looks before I've done anything. So I haven't done any JavaScript, so I make it look like that. What JavaScript brings is the interactivity to say, when I, put my, when I interact with the page in a certain way, when I put my mouse over an element, I want to change those properties. So here, boom, it changes it to be something else. And then when I put my mouse back over that, it changes it again back to the original so after you uh, property in, to get back to the default you'd have to reload the page well you'd have to reload the page or you'd have javascript to set it back to the original cuz what i have here again i didn't reload the page but i have javascript that goes and sets back the title uh, the the appearance of the 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 that title that h1 tag back to what it originally was all right. So again, you know, this is kind of a goofy example and it's just really meant to demonstrate the capabilities and to demonstrate the fact that you can really change anything about um, about it. The point being though is that you can define all these characteristics in your HTML properties that is in your HTML and CSS, but you can dynamically change them without reloading the page by the JavaScript that you write. And that, that allows some interactivity. Other questions? Now, the next thing I want to look at is a very, 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 that's three varies, simplified drop down menu. All right, there we have a menu. And again, all this page is is a menu. All right, so it's just meant to be an example. Notice, though, that when I put my mouse over that, that menu appears. And when I pull my mouse off of it, the menu disappears. Now, I only did it for the one menu item, but simply by repeating the code, you could do it for other menu items. Let's take a look at that and see how we did that. First of all, notice that this page contains HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. They all bring something to the party, so to speak. Notice that in the HTML is really all the menus. So the main menu is there, but the submenu is also there. All right? So what gets delivered from the server to the client is a page that contains a main menu and submenus, the submenu of which is hidden. How is it hidden? 
Well, it's hidden by our friend, CSS. I have an option set for submenu. And again, that's what the dot means, dot submenu. means everything that has a class of submenu. Because I could have more than one submenu, right? I could have a submenu for every main menu selection. I set the display to none. There's actually a couple ways that you can make something invisible. You can set the visibility to true or false. Or no, I'm sorry. You can set the visibility to visible or hidden. But the better way to do that usually is say a display of none. What's the difference between the two ways of doing it? When you do a display of none, it doesn't take up any space. All right? It doesn't take up any space. If I make it invisible, it still sort of takes up the space. It just doesn't show it. So usually, if it's invisible, we don't, wanna, we don't want it to take up the space. So I've hidden the submenus. They get delivered to the client when the client requests this web page. But initially, the CSS hides those. Now, what do I have? The other thing I do is I make sure that there's no margin between my unordered lists. That is critical. It is critical, and I'll show you what happens if we do have a margin. But that allows us to put our mouse from one area to another without the menu disappearing. I then have a on mouse over and on mouse out. On mouse over goes and displays the submenu by setting the visibility, I'm sorry, by setting the display to block. I have an on mouse out that sets the visibility, or I'm sorry, that sets the display to hidden. Then I have the same thing on the submenu. So, I'm viewing the page. I put my mouse over this. It sets the display of the submenu to block. So it makes that a block image. Uh, not block image, but a block tag. I pull my mouse down, and I can select from the submenu. I pull my mouse out from that, and it disappears. Now, this is a case where if you have a border, or, or if, it, if you're debugging it, um, sometimes it's useful to give a background color. Let me show you what happens when you have a margin. So let's say instead of margin of one pixel, I have a margin of 10 pixels for the UL. I put my mouse over there, but when I drop there, it disappears. It's a good way to have fun messing with the user, right? Give them some menu, you know, click this for a million dollars and then they can't get to it, all right? So that's what happens because the on mouse out event happens and I hide it and it's not there for me to put my mouse over it. So I can't execute the mouse over. Now if something like that happens, that's where putting a background color can be useful. So if I didn't realize that was a problem, I could put a background color on this and I could see when I put my mouse over there that there's a little gap between the two. And as I move my mouse down the page and I get into that sort of nether region, all right, on mouse out happens here, but I haven't put my mouse over that one so it doesn't have a chance to appear yet. But if I smash the margins together by saying a margin of zero for those ULs, then they're right touching each other. So as soon as I put my mouse out of this guy, it's over the submenu, and the submenu appears. So now, notice there is no gap between them. So as I put my mouse over that, as soon as it leaves the one UL, it's on the other UL. So it maintains the continuity, and I see both of them. 
Once I do that, then if I want to, once I get it working, I can get rid of the background color. But going in and setting the background color to something that really stands out, I think is an important um, CSS and can be Java uh, script debugging technique because that really shows you where those elements are. You may think you know where the elements line up on the page, but by putting a color on them, you can actually see precisely where those elements line up on the page. So, if we were going to build this, what we would do, what we would do then is we would add a submenu for each of these other main selections, call it submenu 2, submenu 3, and then set the on mouse over to show and hide those respective menus. All right. Again, we would have several instructions because every time we show a new menu, we have to hide all the other ones. So I very likely would create a function to do that. And in fact, because I would be doing the same thing three times, I would probably create a function that contained an argument so that I could say which submenu I wanted to display. It would hide the rest of them and show that. Let's go and do that. If, you don't, if you're not following this part of the lecture, that's okay. But I do want to show a little bit more how to use functions. So, I'm going to go in here. And I'm going to create a script. All right, let me test this out, make sure that it works. And if it works, I'll explain it. And it doesn't work.
lion mouths over. Yeah, that's a problem, all right. Pardon me? Um, that is a great question. I do not know. Sorry, Jerry. Oh, sorry. I'm going to follow my own advice. I'm not going to stare at the code. I'm going to go and look at developer tools, console, arg not defined. Ah, it should be arg menu. Now I'm going to have to go and change these so that you believe that's the right submenu that's displaying because right now it's just saying submenu, submenu, submenu but submenu 1, submenu 2, submenu 3 really all an argument is is a placeholder uh, this is no different than other programming languages um, and um, what you have is um, I want to essentially do the same thing each time, but I want to do it to a different submenu. So I say, whatever submenu I ask for, that's the one I'm going to display. And so when I call the function, I have to supply it with the value of the submenu I want to display, and that's the one I'm going to show. And just for good measure, every time I go and display one, I hide all the other ones just in case there was one of them was still displaying. All right. Um, I'm going to post these examples. Again, this is more meant to give you a taste for uh, the capabilities of JavaScript. Um, do pay attention to the announcements in Canvas and let me know if you have any questions concerning completing your projects. All right, we'll see you up in lab.